Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Alhamdulillahi wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi shirah li sadari, wa yassir li amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani, yafqahu qawli. Rabbana zidna ilma. The one who seeks knowledge is never satisfied. He's never satiated. The one who tastes from the spring of knowledge always desires more. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمَا And say, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the seekers of two concerns are never satisfied. The seekers of two concerns are never satisfied. The seeker of knowledge and the seeker of the world. So we need to ask ourselves here, which one am I? Which one are we? Do we want more knowledge and we spend our time, energies, and wealth on that knowledge? Or do we want more wealth? Do we want more dunya? In the narration, the Prophet وسلم, said, <clears throat> the example of guidance and knowledge with which Allah has sent me is like abundant rain falling on the earth, some of which was fertile soil that absorbed rainwater and brought forth vegetation and grass in abundance. And another portion of it was hard and held the rainwater, and Allah benefited the people with it, and they utilized it for drinking making their animals drink from it, and for irrigation of the land for cultivation. And a portion of it was barren, which could neither hold the water nor bring forth vegetation. In other words, that land gave no benefit, neither to itself nor to others. The first is the example of the person who comprehends Allah's religion and gets benefit, meaning he benefits from the knowledge, which Allah has revealed through me, and he learns it, and then he teaches others. The last example is that of a person who does not care for it. He does not care for the knowledge and does not take Allah's guidance revealed through me. And he, he is like that barren land. So essentially there are three types of people with regards to knowledge. One who benefits himself and also benefits others. One who doesn't benefit himself, but he does benefit others. So the first type of person is who? The one who gains knowledge, retains it, absorbs it, internalizes it, and also gives it to others. He acts upon it himself and he also imparts it to others. That's the first type of person. The second type of person is the one who gains knowledge, but he doesn't benefit himself, although he is benefiting others. He shares with others, but he doesn't do amal himself. And the last one is the one who doesn't benefit himself, nor does he benefit others. So we need to be like the soft land that absorbs the water and produces vegetation. The land that benefits itself and also benefits others. So may Allah enable us to gain this knowledge, internalize it, absorb it. May Allah make this knowledge a spring for our hearts, a life for our hearts, a source of Iman, so that we ourselves grow with this knowledge and we also become beacons of light for others, for all of humanity. Just 20. أَمَّنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَأَنزَلَ لَكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً More precisely, is he not best who created the heavens and the earth and sent down for you rain from the sky? فَأَنبَثْنَا بِهِ حَدَائِقَ ذَاتَ بَهْجَةً causing to grow thereby gardens of joyful beauty. مَا كَانَ لَكُمْ أَن تُنْبِتُوا شَجَرَهَا Which you could not otherwise have grown the trees thereof. أَإِلَاهُمَّ اللَّهِ Is there a deity with Allah? بَلْ هُمْ قَوْمٌ يَعْدِلُونَ But they are a people who ascribe equals to him. Through the signs in the universe, Allah is establishing his oneness, his uluhiyya, that he is the true ma'abud. He is the one who is worthy of worship. And when he is the one who created the heavens and the earth, and he sent down rain from the sky by which the earth produces all kinds of fruits, all kinds of vegetation, then he alone 
is worthy of worship. All of this is not in our control. Can you cause the sky to rain down water? Can you cause the earth to produce vegetation? Many times we plant something inside this earth, but nothing grows, nothing comes out. So it is only Allah who does this. <clears throat> only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes this to happen. So this is a proof that he is the creator. He is the master, the provider, and therefore he alone is the God. A ilahumma Allah? Is there a deity with Allah? But there are people who ascribe equals to him. They don't understand the fact that Allah alone is worthy of worship. He alone is the ilah, but they leave him and they start worshiping others. Now, we must remember that there are three types or three kinds of tawheed. There is tawheed al-uluhiya, tawheed al-rububiya, and tawheed al-asma'i wa sifat. Tawheed al-uluhiya means that Allah alone is the God. He alone is worthy of worship. Tawheed al-rububiya means that he alone is the Lord, the creator, master, owner, provider, sustainer, sovereign. And Tawheed al-asma'i wa sifat means that he alone has the most beautiful names and attributes. So here are proofs of Tawheed al-uluhiya have been mentioned. That he is the one God deserving of worship. وَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ And your God is one God. There's no deity worthy of worship except him, الرحمن الرحيم, the most merciful, the ever merciful. So the creator is the one who is worthy of worship. Now the Mushrikeen of Mecca, they believe that Allah is the creator. They believe that he is the Lord but they would not acknowledge his uluhiyya. They associated partners with him. They would pray to others. They would sacrifice for others. They would make sajda to others. And this is why the first thing that the Prophet ﷺ focused on was to eliminate this fundamental wrong from that society. Because when a person's belief is wrong, then his actions will follow. His actions will also be wrong because the foundation is wrong. But when a person's belief is right, when the belief is sound, that my Lord is the one who does everything for me, then this reforms his character, it reforms his worship, it reforms his dealings. As a matter of fact, it reforms every aspect of his life when the basis or the foundation is sound. So this is the fundamental seed on which the beauty of the tree of Islam is based. All messengers call to this point, that Allah alone is worthy of worship. And this was also the main teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu The main teaching of the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was this, that you worship him alone. And this is why when you invite to the deen, when you invite to the religion, first invite the people to Allah's oneness, because it is on the basis of this that there is salvation in the hereafter. But if a person directs himself to something or someone else, then this will make him restless in this world and also lead to severe outcomes in the hereafter. Is he not best who made the earth a stable ground? And we now know that the earth is constantly moving and the plates of the earth are constantly moving, but how calmly are we able to sit on the earth? How calmly are we able to do our work on this earth, even though there is so much happening within the earth and place within it rivers and made for it firmly set mountains and place between the two seas a barrier, a barrier between two seas. So one is cold and one is warm, one is sweet and one is salty. And who places barrier between the two? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah? Is there a deity with Allah? No. He is one alone worthy of worship, but most of them do not know. Is he not best who responds to the desperate one when he calls upon him and removes evil and makes you inheritors of the earth? Is there a deity with Allah? Little do you remember.
Now there are two points that are mentioned in this ayah. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the dua of the desperate one. When a person makes dua to Allah with sincerity, in desperation, then the dua is accepted, even if it is a non-Muslim. So if we want our duas to be accepted, then we need to make dua to Allah with sincerity, with ikhlas. And even if we feel that we're not so righteous, develop ikhlas in yourself. And inshallah, when you call upon him, he will listen. And what is ikhlas in dua? When you invoke him by saying, Ya Allah, only you can help me. Ya Allah, only you can make a way out for me. This is ikhlas. When you cut off from all others and turn to him alone. And then the second point that is mentioned here is that Allah makes you inheritors of the earth. He makes you come to this world in succession. Now just imagine if all of humanity came to this world all at once, what would happen then? And we see in today's circumstances even, some countries find it very difficult to manage their populations. Roads are not enough, houses are not enough, food is not enough. So imagine if all the people from the time of Adam, Adam till now were on this earth at the same time. From the first to the last, all on this earth at the same time. What would happen then? So this is also a huge blessing from Allah. وَيَجْعَلُكُمْ خُلَفَاءَ الْأَرْضِ That he made you successors. He made you inheritors of the earth. One generation after another. And this transition is so smooth that you don't even feel it. One generation departs, another comes in its place. Is he not best who guides you through the darknesses of the land and the sea and who sends the winds as good tidings before his mercy? Allah? Is there a deity with Allah? High is Allah above whatever they associate with him. Is he not best who begins creation and then repeats it and who provides for you from the heaven and the earth? Allah? Is there a deity with Allah? No. Allah is the only God. He is the only ilah. Say, produce your proof if you should be truthful. Meaning, if you worship, if you worship others besides Allah, then bring any evidence that they have created something or they have done something. And also here indirectly, we are reminded that the one who created the first time will create again, and he will take accountability. Qul, say, none in the heavens and the earth knows the unseen except Allah, and they do not perceive when they will be resurrected. No one besides Allah knows when they'll be raised again after death. Only Allah knows. Rather, their knowledge is arrested concerning the hereafter. Rather, they're in doubt about it. Rather, they're concerning it blind. Now this tells us that the knowledge of the coming of the day of judgment is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even with the prophets, nor the angels. So as opposed to asking when will it come, one needs to worry about preparing for it. As opposed to asking when is it, we need to ask what have I done for it? What have I prepared for it? Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu narrated, a Bedouin asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when is the hour? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what have you prepared for it? The man said, love for Allah and his Messenger. The Prophet said, you will be with those whom you love. So we need to analyze how much do we love Allah and his Messenger? Because whoever a person loves, he will be with them. He will be in their company. Because what happens is that when we love someone, we take them as a role model and we try to become like them subconsciously. We want to be like them. So for example, when you like someone's recitation, it's a very small example. When you like someone's recitation, then you try to recite like them. This is something very, very natural. When we look up to someone, 
when we take them as our role model, then we want to be just like them. So those whom you love, you will be with them on the day of judgment. And those who disbelieve say, when we have become dust, as well as our forefathers, will we indeed be brought out of the graves? Now, they're not asking this because they want to get an answer or they want to actually know whether this is going to happen or not. The reason why they're asking this is out of denial. They didn't believe in this. They found it impossible. They found it far-fetched. We have been promised this. We and our forefathers before. This is not but legends of the former peoples. These are just stories, folklore, tales. So in other words, they doubted the resurrection. They doubted the coming of the day of judgment and they thought that it wasn't going to happen. Ul, O Prophet, say to them, travel through the land, travel through the earth and observe how was the end of the criminals. How was the end of the past nations? What happened to them? Messengers were sent to them. The message was delivered to them. Signs were shown to them. But when they rejected, when they refused, when they denied, and they also doubted the resurrection, what became of them? What happened to them? So go, travel, and look at their ruins. Look at their end and take a lesson for yourself. Lest the same thing happens to you as what happened to them. And grieve not over them or be in distress from what they conspire. And they say, when is the fulfillment of this promise, if you should be truthful? Promise here referring to the punishment. All, all prophets say, Perhaps it is close behind you, some of that for which you're impatient. And indeed, your Lord is full of bounty for the people which is why he gives them time, he gives them respite, he doesn't seize them immediately for their sins, but most of them do not show gratitude. Most of them are not grateful for this blessing. The time that Allah gives to us, the respite is a blessing from him so that we leave our sins, so that we repent, so that we turn back to him. But when people don't, then that is their in gratitude. And this is the case with the majority of the people. And indeed, your Lord knows what their breasts conceal and what they declare. And there's nothing concealed within the heaven and the earth except that it is in a clear register. And what is meant by kitab here is which is the preserved tablet. Everything is recorded and written in the preserved tablet. Yani Allah has a record of everything. Indeed, this Quran relates to the Bani Israel, most of that over which they disagree. And indeed, it is guidance. This Quran is a guidance and a mercy for the believers. So here Allah is praising the Quran. This Quran is a source of guidance and a means of mercy. Lil mu'mineen. Why only the believers? Why only guidance and mercy for the believers? Why are they singled out for mention? Because it is only the believers who benefit from this book. Otherwise, this book is for everyone. But the one who doesn't believe in it, the one who turns away from it, the one who doubts it, cannot gain guidance from it. And so in order to benefit from the Quran, in order to attain guidance from the Quran, Iman is a condition. Iman is a requirement. Indeed, your Lord will judge between them by his wise judgment, and he is the exalted in might, the knowing. Fatawakkil on Allah. So rely upon Allah, trust on him, depend on him. Indeed, you are upon the clear truth. Indeed, you will not make the dead hear, nor will you make the deaf hear the call when they have turned their backs retreating. Now, who is meant by this? Who is meant by the deaf and the dead? This refers to the one who is heedless of hearing the truth and the one whose heart is dead, the one whose heart is not alive. No matter how much you tell him, admonish him, advise him, it will not make a difference. He will not benefit. Just like you, for example, in the state of sleep, a person doesn't understand what is said to him. So when a person is sleeping and he doesn't understand what is said to him, then how can a dead person understand? So, this is referring to the disbelievers. 
those whose hearts are dead and they do not hear. And so the words of the Quran don't affect them. The teachings of the messenger don't reach their hearts. They don't comprehend them. And that is why they turn away. And you cannot guide the blind away from their error. Those who are deaf and blind to the truth, you cannot show them the way because they don't want to see the way. You will only make here those who believe in our verses so they are Muslims. Only those who submit to Allah, those who surrender themselves to their Lord are the ones who listen to the ayat of the Quran and they benefit from it. وَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ And when the word befalls them, أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِّنَ الْأَرْضِ We will bring forth for them a creature from the earth. تُكَلِّمُهُمْ Speaking to them. And what will it say to them? أَنَّ النَّاسَ كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا لَا يُقِنُونَ That the people were of our verses not certain in faith. This ayah mentions دَابَّةُ الْأَرْضِ the creature that will rise from the earth, a beast that will emerge from the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause this beast to emerge as one of his wondrous signs, as his amazing sign to prove to the people what they were doubting. Just the way a she-camel walked out of a mountain at the time of Salih alayhi near the end of time, Towards the end of time, Allah will bring out a creature from the earth that will warn the people. What is this creature? What does it look like? What exactly is it? We do not know as we don't find an exact description of the creature, but it will be a living creature from the earth. And this will be after the Jal, after Isa alayhi salam and Ya'juj and Ma'juj, when the Quran will be taken away, when people will be in total darkness and ignorance, after the sun rises from the west, so as a last offer of guidance to the people, the dabbatum min al-ard, this creature from the earth will come forth. And that is so that people don't have any argument against Allah on the day of judgment. Allah will send this dab. Because by this time, when the beast emerges, people will have lost all faith. So a living beast will come out of the earth, proving to them resurrection, and it will speak to the people, to kalimuhum, it will communicate with them, reminding them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with regards to this, we find a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he said, when the creature of the earth will emerge, it will put a mark on people's noses, and these people will remain among you until if a man will buy a camel and ask, who did you buy it from? He will say, I bought it from the one of the people who is marked on his nose. So Allah knows best whether these people who are branded, who are marked, are from among the good people or the bad people. We don't know because the hadith does not specify. And uh, you know, the point of mentioning this is that as opposed to a person becoming excited, that it'll be so cool to see this beast how amazing it would be. No, one should actually fear because this is one of the major signs of the day of judgment. That now the day of judgment is very near, very close, through which the argument would be established against the people. And warn of the day, which day? The day of judgment, when we will gather from every nation a company of those who deny our signs and they will be driven in rows. And similar kinds of people will be gathered together and driven in rows until when they arrive at the place of judgment. He will say, did you deny my signs while you encompass them not in knowledge? You didn't even try to know. You didn't even try to learn and you rejected them. You denied them? Or what was it that you were doing? Even today, many people who call themselves Muslim object to the ayat of the Quran and they don't understand the wisdoms behind it. So they will say things like, why is this mentioned? And why does that happen? Now, the reason why they're asking these questions is because of their lack of knowledge, and especially in the matters of divine decree, in the matters of qada wal qadr, 
they object and criticize. Like for example, you will find some people saying, why doesn't Allah stop people from committing dhulm? Why doesn't Allah stop people from injustices and oppression? Why doesn't this happen? Why are there calamities? Why are people suffering in this world? You will hear these kind of things. The reason why people say these things is because they lack knowledge, they lack ilm. In this, the first thing that we need to remember is that Allah Himself says in the Quran, وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِظَلَّامِ لِلْعَبِيدِ And your Lord is not at all unjust to the servants. So if you believe in the Quran, then the Quran is telling us that Allah does not do any injustice to the people. It's people who do dhulm to each other. It's people who wrong each other. So now this leads to the second question. People then say, well, why doesn't Allah stop those people from dhulm? Why does Allah allow people to do dhulm to one another? Now you see, the way of Allah is that he has given respite and time to people. And he doesn't force people. Yani, we don't know the wisdom as to why Allah gives some people respite and what he has prepared for those who are oppressed. We don't know this. Also, we need to ask ourselves that do we know the whole story and reasons and causes and the circumstances behind the situation of the oppressor and the oppressed? Why did that happen? Was there a shortcoming on his part? Was there a shortcoming on part of the people around him? Yani, the point is that we cannot blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say that he should have interfered and stopped that wrong in its tracks. That's not the way of Allah. Allah does not compel people. He does not force people. He's given them a choice. He's given them freedom. And then you might think, why does he not force people? That's because only Allah knows. He knows and we don't know. This is a test in the life of this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim and he is hakim. He is the all-knowing and he's the ever-wise. Every decision of his is based on wisdom, on hikmah. The problem is that when we think we are smarter, when we think that we know more, that is when we start to object and criticize. But when we acknowledge that our knowledge is limited, Subhanak la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana. When we acknowledge this, then things will start making sense to us. And this solves many problems. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Allah knows. He knows the wisdoms. And very soon Allah shows the wisdoms as well. And later on you realize, oh, this was what was intended through the situation. So anyhow, what is mentioned here is that when these people arrive at the place of judgment on the day of judgment, Allah will ask them, did you deny my signs while you encompass them not in knowledge? You had no knowledge and you rejected, you objected, you criticized, or what was it that you were doing? And the decree will befall them for the wrong they did and they will not be able to speak. Do they not see that we made the night that they may rest therein? And the day giving sight, indeed in that are signs for people who believe. If people reflect and ponder, then there are many signs in the coming and the going of the night. The night arriving, the night departing, there are many signs in this, if people were to ponder and reflect. And warn of the day, the day of judgment, the horn will be blown, and whoever is in the heavens, and whoever is on the earth will be terrified, except whom Allah wills and all will come to him humbled. Now, the blowing of the horn here, this is called nafkhatul faza. Nafkhatul faza, when everyone will be terrified. And then will be nafkhatul sa'iq, when everything will perish. And then nafkhatul ba'ath, when everything will be, or everyone rather, will be resurrected everyone will rise again from the earth. So upon the blowing of the horn, whoever's in the heavens and whoever's on the earth will be terrified, except for whom Allah wills, and all will come to him humbled. And you see the mountains thinking them rigid, while they will pass as the passing of clouds. 
It is the work of Allah who perfected all things. Indeed, he's acquainted with that which you do. Man jaa bil hasanah. Whoever comes with a good deed, whoever comes on the day of judgment with a righteous deed, falahu khairum minha. He will have better than it. Wahum min fazaa yawma idin aminun. And they from the terror of that day will be safe. They will be safe from the terror of that day. Earlier, the faza of the day of judgment was mentioned. The terror of the day of judgment was mentioned. Here, who will be saved from it has been mentioned. And that is the one who comes with a good deed. And remember, the one who does good, the reward with Allah is so much more than the good deed that he has done. And not only this, but they will also be in peace on the day of judgment. They'll be saved from the faza, from the terror of the day of judgment. You know, when we read about the day of judgment, we feel worried, we feel scared, anxious, alone, concerned, sometimes even sad when we think about the events on the day of judgment and we think to ourselves, I don't know what's going to happen to me, what's going to become of me and how can I save myself? So this ayah tells us that good deeds removes the horror of that day when everyone will leave you, your parents, your children, your spouse, your family, your friends, when no one will ask about you, it is your deeds that will be with you. And the good that a person does, he will have a minimum of 10 rewards. And even more than that, depending on his intention, the more sincere the intention, the more ikhlas he has, the greater the reward. And really, it is such a huge mercy from Allah that we do something for a very short amount of time. We do something for a short while, whereas the angels, if you think about it, they're constantly doing tasbih. They're constantly glorifying Allah, praising Allah, worshiping Allah, but there's no reward for that. And we just say once, Alhamdulillah, and it fills the scales, it fills the balance. So even then, if we don't do dhikr, even then, if we don't do good, then what a great loss it is. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who removes something harmful from the path of the Muslims, Allah writes for him a good deed. And the one for whom Allah writes a good deed, because of that, Allah will admit him into Jannah, into paradise. So we don't know which good deed that we do becomes a means of entrance into paradise. And that is why we must not belittle any righteous action. In another narration, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not regard any good deed insignificant. Don't belittle any good deed. Even meeting your brother with a cheerful face, smiling. Smiling is a good deed. Smiling is sadaqah, it is charity. If you cannot do anything else, at least smile and reward will be written for you. And whoever comes with an evil deed, their faces will be overturned into the fire and it will be said to them, are you recompensed except for what you used to do? Meaning one sin brings one evil. Whereas when a person does a good deed, the reward for that good deed is multiplied. But when a person commits a sin, it brings one evil. So if still a person's sins outweigh his good, then what can be his outcome except for loss, except for failure? O Prophet say, I have only been commanded to worship the Lord of this city. The reference here is towards the city of Mecca, who made it sacred and to whom belongs all things. And I'm commanded to be of the Muslims. I'm commanded to be of those who surrender and submit to Allah. And to recite the Quran, meaning I have also been commanded to recite the Quran. And whoever is guided is only guided for the benefit of himself. And whoever strays say, I'm only one of the warners. Now one meaning of this, and atlu al Quran is that the Prophet وسلم, is told to recite the Quran to the people. Now, the Quran is read and it is also recited, and there's a difference between the two. There's a difference between 
reading the Quran and reciting the Quran because the effect is different. Reading yourself is very good, but when you listen to it being recited, you understand more because you're reflecting more, you're thinking more. So he is commanded to recite the Quran to the people. Another meaning is that I keep reciting it. I keep conveying the message because the Quran is sufficient to guide to the straight path. So reading the Quran just once is not sufficient, but it should be recited and read again and again and again in the month of Ramadan and even after. And in the month of Ramadan, at least go through it once. And if you can do more, that's even better because the Quran serves as a reminder. It serves as a refresher. It springs your heart to life. It answers your questions. It solves your problems. So having a connection with the book of Allah is very, very crucial, very important. And a continuous connection, not just a one-time connection. So for those of you who are studying the Quran for the first time, make it your goal, make it your target, that once the month of Ramadan is over, inshallah, I want to go back and study it again and keep studying it. You study it once, go back to it again because the Quran is a dhikr. It is a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a book that keeps us on the straight path. Alhamdulillah, And say all praise is due to Allah. All hamd belongs to him. He is deserving of it. Sayurikum ayati. He will show you his signs. Fata'arifunaha. And you will recognize them. You will recognize the signs that he shows. Wama rabbuka bighafid in amma ta'amalun. And your Lord is not unaware of what you do. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the ever merciful. Qasin meem. These are the verses of the clear book. We recite to you from the news of Musa and Fir'aun in truth for a people who believe. Again, natlu alayka, natlu. We recite to you from the news of Musa and Fir'aun in truth. This is a true story that is mentioned here for a people who believe. Surah Al-Qasas mentions the story of Musa salam in a lot of detail. His birth his childhood, his youth, his marriage, how Allah chose him for prophethood and how he became a means of guidance for the people. Indeed, Fir'aun exalted himself in the land and made its people into factions, oppressing a sector among them. And those were the Bani Israel, slaughtering their newborn sons and keeping their females alive. Indeed, he was of the corruptors. Now this ayah, reveals the political system of Fir'aun by which he governed the people, how he ruled over his people. And that was by instituting this evil concept of divide and rule. They lived in the same land, but Fir'aun divided the society such that the Bani Israel were always considered the other. They were looked down upon by the Egyptians that even though Fir'aun was having their children slaughtered, he was having the children of Bani Israel slaughtered no one opposed this from his people. A genocide was taking place, but his people never opposed him. And that's because when people are divided, then they're blinded by their animosity towards the other. And they also lose their reasoning, they lose their senses, and they become blinded from such actions. So anyhow, that is what is mentioned here, that he had, he had divided the people into factions and he had oppressed a sector among them, and they were the Bani Israel. Now it is said that Fir'aun saw a dream that a child would be born to the Bani Israel who would be the cause of his demise, who would be a cause of his downfall, and so he decided to kill all their sons. So every year, year after year, he was killing their sons, but then he realized that if we keep killing their sons, then who would do the labor work? Who would serve them? Because the Bani Israel were enslaved by the people of Fir'aun. So if their sons are killed, then who would do the labor work for them? So then they decided to kill the sons born in one year, and the next year, they would not kill the sons. So one year they would kill the sons, one year they wouldn't, the next year they would, the following year they wouldn't. So the year Harun was born, the boys were not killed, 
But the year in which Musa was born, they were killed. But look at how Allah made arrangements for protecting Musa And we wanted to confer favor upon those who were oppressed in the land and made them leaders and make them inheritors and establish them in the land and show Fir'aun and his minister Haman and their soldiers through them that which they had feared. So Allah planned. What was the plan? It started with a woman. It started with Umm Musa, the mother of Musa alayhi salam. ila Umm Musa. And we inspired to the mother of Musa. Awahina, we did wahi to her. And wahi means hidden indication, inspiration. Perhaps an angel came to her and told her to do this. Perhaps she saw the angel or perhaps she didn't. But through some way, she was inspired. Allah inspired to the mother of Musa, an ardi'i, suckle him, nurse him. But when you fear for him, when you fear that they will come and take his life, cast him into the river and do not fear and do not grieve. Because for a mother, her child, her baby is very precious. Even older children are, but newborns are more precious. And with Musa salam, anyways, Allah had placed love on him. So whoever saw him, whoever saw Musa salam, loved him. So here, Allah reassures his mother, don't grieve. Everything will be okay. Everything will be fine. Indeed, we will return him to you and will make him one of the messengers. This was Allah's promise. And later we see that Allah fulfilled the promise. So two promises are mentioned here. We will return him to you. And this was fulfilled almost immediately. And the second promise, we will make him one of the messengers. And this was fulfilled after many years. Now here in this ayah we see that a specific command is given to Umm Musa. And that is an ardi'i, suckle him, nurse him, so that how many ever days he's with his mother, he drinks her milk so that he becomes strong, he becomes healthy. Because when children are given mother's milk from day one, they develop stronger immune systems. And also the rest of their growth is better comparatively. And they're also protected from, they're protected from many kinds of illnesses, many kinds of diseases. So this specific point has been emphasized here. Now notice that it hasn't been said, bathe him every day or play with him every day. Because anyways, people do this, right? They, they play with their children, they bathe them, they feed them. And anyways, a mother also nurses her child, but there is emphasis on this. So when emphasis is placed on something, it shows the importance as well. And then later on, you will see the strength of Musa salam. He was very, very strong, physically very strong. So how drinking his mother's milk affected his health. So anyhow, she did what she was told. She put Musa salam in a basket and put the basket into the river. And Musa salam, went to the other side of the river. And the family of Fir'aun picked him up out of the river. SubhanAllah, the enemy picked him up so that he would become to them an enemy and a cause of grief. Indeed, Fir'aun and Haman and their soldiers were deliberate sinners. And the wife of Fir'aun said, but look at how Allah made arrangements for guarding Musa salam, within the enemy. So, he reached the other side, the family of Fir'aun picked him up, and the wife of Fir'aun, she was a believing woman, she said, he will be a comfort of the eye for me and for you. Now she spoke in such a good way, and she got such a difficult task done and made this child heirs. La taqtulu, don't kill him because Fir'aun intended to kill this child, but she stopped him, don't kill him. Perhaps he may benefit us or we may adopt him as a son. And they perceive not. They did not realize at that time what they were doing. So what we learn here is that in an environment where everyone is corrupt, where the whole government is corrupt, even if there's one person 
who is just and fair, then that one person can become a means of benefiting the entire nation. Here, Fir'aun, Haman, and Qarun were all corrupt. They were wrongdoers. Their courtiers were also corrupt. But the wife of Fir'aun was a righteous, pious, just woman. So because of her request, because of her effort, Musa السلام, was saved. So what happened? And the heart of Musa's mother became empty of all else. It was almost unbearable for her. Imagine a mother putting her infant in a basket into the river. Imagine the state of the heart. Her heart became empty of everything else except for the thought of her baby, her child. She was about to disclose the matter concerning him had we not bound fast her heart, had we not strengthened her heart that she would be of the believers. So Allah put her in this test so that her yaqeen becomes firm so that her conviction increases. And she said to his sister, the sister of Musa alayhi salam, Qusihi, follow him. So she watched him from a distance while they perceived not. So she followed the basket and she stayed away so that they would not perceive that she was watching. And we had prevented from him all wet nurses before. So she said, shall I direct you to a household that will be responsible for him, for you, while there are to him for his upbringing sincere. So we restored him to his mother. So he came back to his mother so that she might be content and not grieve. Sometimes a blessing is taken away from a person such that separation from that blessing is almost unbearable. It's painful, it's difficult. So why does that happen then? It happens because Allah wants to give you something better so that she might be content and not grieve, and that she would know that the promise of Allah is true. Allah promised her that we will return him to you. And he did that. But most of the people do not know. Now, what happened was when the Al of Fir'aun picked up Musa salam, and they decided to keep him, obviously he was an infant, so he needed to drink milk, but he refused all the wet nurses. And this was also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He refused all the wet nurses. And when his sister saw that she directed them by saying what she said, shall I direct you to a household that will be responsible for him? And so they agreed. They agreed. She had directed them to Umm Musa. Now the palace, when they found out that Musa alayhi salam uh, would be, because they did not know that Umm Musa was his mother. So they had asked her, why don't you shift to the palace? Move to the palace and nurse Musa alayhi salam. But she said she couldn't shift to the palace because she had her own family, she had her children. So Musa alayhi salam every day would be taken to his mother. He was returned to her. And so in her care, she looked after him, nursed him, did his tarbiyah, and brought him up on the religion, on the deen. And when he attained his full strength, and was mentally mature. Physically, he became strong and also mentally mature. We bestowed upon him judgment and knowledge. And thus do we reward the doers of good. And he entered the city at a time of inattention by its people and found therein two men fighting, one from his faction, one from the Bani Israel, and one from among his enemy. And the one from his faction called for help to him against the one from his enemy. So Musa struck him. Musa struck the Egyptian. So from this, you can realize the strength of Musa salam, and unintentionally killed him. Musa salam said, this is from the work of shaitan. Immediately, he acknowledged that this was wrong. Indeed, he is a manifest misleading enemy. Qala, he said, Rabbi inni dhalamtu nafsi, faghfir li. My Lord, indeed, I have wronged myself, so forgive me. Faghfara lah. And he forgave him. Allah forgave him. Innahu huwa al rahim Indeed, he is the forgiving, the merciful. Anytime shaitan puts waswasa in your mind, he puts this thought in your mind that your sins will not be forgiven because you're such a great sinner. Remember, that if the sin of killing can be forgiven, 
then the sins that are lesser than that, Allah can forgive as well. So always remain hopeful. Always remain positive. Always have good thoughts about your Lord. And this tells us that a person can only save himself from the consequences of sins with istighfar. Don't go deeper and deeper into sin because of this thought that I will not be forgiven. This thought is from shaitan. Come out of this thought. Look at the mercy of Allah. Look at the vastness of his mercy. Turn to him. Seek forgiveness. Do tawbah. And inshallah, he will forgive. And this is the way to protect yourself from the consequences of sins because sins do have consequences. So here we see Musa alayhi salam regretted the punch which resulted in a loss of life. So due to this regret, he turned back to Allah. He sought forgiveness and Allah made a way out for him. And Musa alayhi salam considers this act zulm against himself. Inni zalamtu nafsi. Indeed, I have wronged myself. So when we do something wrong, we're actually not harming the other, we're harming ourselves. So forgive me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. The Prophet used to seek forgiveness more than 70 times in a day. And he would also often make the following dua, Allahumma li ma akhta'atu. وَمَا تَعَمَّدْتُ وَمَا أَسْرَرْتُ وَمَا أَعْلَنْتُ وَمَا جَهِلْتُ وَمَا تَعَمَّدْتُ O Allah, forgive me my mistakes and what I have done deliberately, secretly and openly in ignorance and intentionally. So this is a very effective dua. There are different words that you can use to seek forgiveness and one of them is this dua. He said, Musa salam said, My Lord, for the favor you bestowed upon me, I will never be an assistant to the criminals. This is the meaning of tawbah, that I will not make this mistake again. And he became inside the city fearful and anticipating exposure. When suddenly, the one who sought his help the previous day cried out to him once again. Because what happened the previous day as you read in the ayah earlier, it was a time of inattention where people were not around. It was just the three of them. So nobody knew what happened. So the following day, the same person who had sought his help before cried out to him for help again. Musa salam said to him, indeed, you're an evident, persistent deviator. Now you're wrong. You're the one who is picking fights with others. And when he wanted to strike the one who was an enemy to both of them, meaning the Egyptian, and not strike as in punch him again, what this means is that he wanted to uh, push him back so that the two stopped fighting. He said, the man from the Bani Israel said, O Musa, do you intend to kill me as you killed someone yesterday? You only want to be a tyrant in the land and do not want to be of the amenders. So this man exposed Musa salam, in front of the other Egyptian. And so the news spread. Everybody found out what happened. So Fir'aun and his people then conspired to kill Musa salam. But someone from within the court of Fir'aun, who well wished for Musa salam, he came to warn Musa. And a man came from the farthest end of the city running. He said, oh Musa, indeed the eminent ones are conferring over you, intending to kill you because the news had spread. So leave the city, immediately leave. Indeed, I am to you of the sincere advisors. Now you see Musa salam, the first time his life was in danger was when he was born. And this is the second time. Again, now his life is in danger. So sometimes this happens and a person wonders, why does this happen? We need to remember it happened to the prophets of Allah as well. So he left it, he left the city fearful and anticipating apprehension. Qala, he said, My Lord, save me from the wrongdoing people. And when he directed himself towards Madian, he said, perhaps my Lord will guide me to the sound way, the way that leads straight to the destination. Now see, at every occasion, Musa salam, is making dua. So from this, you can realize that his connection with Allah was so strong. And here as well, Perhaps my Lord will guide me to the sound way. 
So this tells us that we should depend on Allah even when it comes to directions. When you lose the way, when your GPS does not work, Google Maps is not working, Waze is not working, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make dua to him to show you the way. And you were so dependent on him for everything. And when he came to the well of Madian, so Musa salam, left Egypt and he traveled from Egypt until he arrived in Madian. He found there a crowd of people watering their flocks, their flock of sheep. And he found aside from them two women driving back their flocks. He said, what is your circumstance? What's the matter? How come you're standing to the side and not watering your flock? They said, we do not water until the shepherds dispatch their flocks and our father is an old man. So very briefly, they mentioned their problem. So he watered their flocks for them and he did this lillahi fillahi without any greed, without expecting any return. He helped them for the sake of Allah and then he went back to the shade. So he watered the flock for them he didn't hang around there. He went back to the shade. فَقَالَ And he said, رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ My Lord, indeed I am for whatever good you would send down to me in need. This is the perfect example of wanting the reward only from Allah. He didn't say to them, I helped you, so now it's your turn to help me. He helped them without expecting anything in return. He made dua to Allah. He expressed his needs before Allah. And this is how we need to make dua. We should humble ourselves before him. We should express our absolute dependency on Allah. And the more we do that, the more the chances that there are of our duas being accepted. So we must realize our neediness before Allah that only Allah can give. We need to realize our poverty and his richness, our neediness and his generosity, our helplessness and his power. So Musa salam, expressed his absolute and total dependency on Allah when he made this dua to him at a time when the future seemed so uncertain. And almost immediately, his dua was answered. How did this happen? that his dua was answered right away, and right away his difficulty was resolved. It's because Musa salam, resolved someone else's difficulty first. He helped someone out without expecting anything in return, and look at how Allah helped him. The Prophet wasallam said, whoever removes a worldly grief from a believer, Allah will remove from him one of the griefs of the day of resurrection. And whoever alleviates the need of a needy person, Allah will alleviate his needs in this world and the hereafter. Whoever shields or hides the misdeeds of a Muslim, Allah will shield him in this world and the hereafter. And Allah will help his servant so long as he helps his brother. So long as you are helping someone, Allah will continue to help you. The Prophet Sallallahu also said, of the most virtuous of deeds is to put a smile on the face of a believer, to pay off his debt, to fulfill some need of his, or to remove some hardship from him. So if we want Allah to resolve our affairs, our matters in life, then this is what we need to do. Any difficulty, look around you. Look around you, is there someone in distress? Is there someone who needs help? Is there someone who's going through some problem? Don't wait for them to call you for help, but you look for them. Recognize them by their facial expressions, that this person needs help, let me help them out. So take interest in others, notice the problems of others. And remember when you do good to others, Allah will do good to you. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُدِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ The recompense for good is nothing except for good. So anyhow, when Musa a.s. made dua, Allah made arrangements for him. He got a job, he got married, everything fell into place, everything happened. Then one of the two women came to him walking with shyness, with haya, and not just haya, but a lot of haya, a lot of haya, istihya. She said, Indeed, my father invites you 
that he may reward you for having watered for us. So when they came to him, when Musa salam, came to the father of the two girls and related to him the story of what happened in Egypt and he left Egypt, now he's in Madian. So the father said to him, fear not, la takhaf, fear not. You have escaped from the wrongdoing people. Now this is a different land, it's a different country, it's a different region, and Fir'aun does not have authority here. So you're safe here. Fir'aun does not rule here. Now, what I want to point out here in this ayah is that specifically here, the haya of the girl has been mentioned. That she came walking with haya, with shyness. And this is a quality that Allah loves. Allah loves the quality of haya, modesty, bashfulness. And this quality is a part of iman. Iman and haya go hand in hand. They're inseparable. You cannot separate the two. Because if you separate the two, then the other is also gone. When iman leaves, there's no haya. When haya leaves, iman also leaves. So the two are together. And then haya is also the key to goodness. It brings only goodness upon goodness. And haya is a distinctive feature of our religion, of our deen. One of the women said, oh, my father, hire him. Indeed, the best one you can hire is the strong and the trustworthy. But these qualities coming together in one person is very rare. Usually, those who do know how to do a work are not trustworthy. They will cut corners, they will outsmart their boss. And on the other hand, those who are trustworthy, they will not know how to do the work. And that's why when you make dua for supporters, also say that they should be qawiyun ameen, strong and trustworthy. Because our deen teaches us that when you entrust a work to someone, that person needs to have both qualities. Trustworthiness, that they will fulfill the trust, they will fulfill the amana, and they're also capable of doing the work. He said, meaning the father of the two girls, he said, indeed, I wish to wed you one of these, my two daughters one of them, on the condition that you serve me for eight years. But if you complete 10, it will be as a favor from you. And I do not wish to put you in difficulty. You will find me, if Allah wills, from among the righteous. Musa salam said, that is established between me and you. Whichever of the two terms I complete, there's no injustice to me. And Allah, over what we say, is a witness. And it is said that Musa salam completed 10 years because he was a muhsin. He was a doer of good. So he chose the longer of the two period. So he worked there for 10 years. And after he worked there for 10 years, herding sheep, growing in his experience, growing in his maturity, after all this training, Allah chose him for a great mission. Everything that happens in life happens for a reason. And when Musa had completed the term and was traveling with his family. And Ahl here refers to his wife. He was traveling with his wife. So what this tells us is that it is the right of the husband to take his wife wherever he wants. So you cannot put a condition that the husband cannot take her. He has to keep the girl in the same place as her parents or in the same city as her parents. And this cannot be kept as a condition. The temporary arrangements can be made, like here we see Musa -Islam stayed with his in-laws for 10 years. But to make this binding upon the husband is not right. Because after marriage, it's the right of the husband to take his wife with him wherever he's traveling, even if it is to a different country. So anyhow, Musa -Islam is now leaving. He didn't leave his wife behind in Madian. His wife is traveling with him. So what happened? As they're traveling, it's nighttime, it's cold. So they're making their way. So they're making their way to Egypt now. He perceived from the direction of the Mount of Fire. So Musa salam sees a fire in the distance from the direction of the Mount. He said to his family, stay here. Indeed, I have perceived a fire. Perhaps I will bring you from there some information or burning wood from the fire that you may warm yourselves. It was nighttime 
It was chilly, it was cold. So Musa السلام, left to get a flame of fire to warm his family. Now this shows that in a journey, the husband should take extra care of his wife and children. He should pay attention to their warmth, their cold, the temperature. Not that he sets the temperature of his liking in the car and the wife and the kids are screaming from the back. And then even otherwise, he should take care of their needs, their food, their drink, and likewise other needs. And this is why the man has been made the qawam so that he takes care of his family. Now, good thing he didn't say to his wife, I see a fire, you go get it, and I'll wait for you here. And this is what we see happening today. So Musa is in, subhanAllah, you know, in the service of his family, he, he leaves. He leaves and he, he's climbing a mountain even so that he can bring some information and some burning wood so that his wife, his family could warm themselves. But when he came to it, when he came to it, to what? To what he perceived was fire. He was called from the right side of the valley in a blessed spot from the tree. Ayya Musa, O Musa, inni an Allahu Rabbul Alameen. Indeed, I am Allah, Lord of the worlds. SubhanAllah. When a person does good, he receives good. He left to fulfill the needs of his family. And look at the good that Allah granted him. Good brings good, and evil brings evil. And that's why when you learn of a good deed, hasten to do it. You don't know what goodness you will receive in return. When he arrived at Madian, he did a good deed. And Allah provided him with a family, with work, with shelter, with everything. And now when he's coming back to Egypt from Madian, he sets out for helping his family. And Allah grants him prophethood. And he was told, throw down your staff. But when he saw it writhing as if it was a snake, he turned in flight and did not return. Because naturally, a person gets afraid. Imagine a snake coming towards you. You would fear, and it's a natural type of fear. Allah said to him, Ya Musa, O Musa, aqbil, approach, wa la taqaf, and fear not. Indeed, you are of the secure. Nothing will happen. Insert your hand into the opening of your garment. It will come out white without disease and draw in your arm close to you as prevention from fear. Now this was for Musa salam, and this is also for us. Anytime you feel fear, put your hand on your heart. Bring your arms close to your chest and you will feel much better because fear is related to the heart. For those are two proofs from your Lord to Fir'aun and his establishment. Indeed, they have been a people defiantly disobedient. He said, my Lord, indeed I killed from among them someone and I fear they will kill me. And my brother Harun is more fluent than me in tongue. So send him with me as a support, verifying me. Indeed, I fear that they will deny me. Allah said, we will strengthen your arm through your brother and grant you both supremacy so they will not reach you. It will be through our signs. You and those who follow you will be the predominant. And saving you is our duty. So look at how Allah saved him from such an arrogant tyrant. But when Musa came to them with our signs as clear evidences, they said, this is not except invented magic. And we have not heard of this religion among our forefathers. And Musa said, my Lord is more knowing than we or you of who has come with guidance from him and to whom will be succession in the home. Indeed, wrongdoers do not succeed. The Zalimun can never be successful. And Fir'aun said, O eminent ones, I have not known you to have a God other than me. Then ignite for me, O Haman, a fire upon the clay and make for me a tower that I may look at the God of Musa. SubhanAllah. Now you see, at that time there were no rockets, there were not any spaceships for him to sit on a spaceship and go up. So he says to Haman to build a structure to build a tower so that he can look at the God of Musa. But how high can the tower be anyways? It cannot reach the sky. Basically what he meant or the reason why he said this was to show his power. He was so proud of his structures. He was so arrogant over his buildings. So in arrogance and denial, this is what he says. 
And indeed, I do think he's among the liars. SubhanAllah, look at what he's saying about Musa alayhi Now, messengers are the most honest people. But look at the false accusations of people against them. And he was arrogant. Yani Fir'aun was arrogant. He and his soldiers in the land without right. They had no right to be arrogant. And they thought that they would not be returned to us. This was their problem. They had forgotten death. They had forgotten the hereafter. So we took him and his soldiers and threw them into the sea. They were flung into the sea. So see how was the end of the wrongdoers. Because remember, the wrongdoers can never be successful. And we made them leaders inviting to the fire. And on the day of resurrection, they will not be helped. And we caused to overtake them in this world a curse. And on the day of resurrection, they will be of the despised. And we gave Musa the scripture. After we had destroyed the former generations, as enlightenment for the people and guidance and mercy so that they might be reminded. So here the Torah is being praised. And you, O Prophet, were not on the western side of the mount when we revealed to Musa the command, and you were not among the witnesses to that. So if the Prophet ﷺ wasn't there, how does he know about this story then? He knows about this story because Allah revealed it in the Quran through wahi, through revelation. But we produced many generations after Musa and prolonged was their duration. And you were not a resident among the people of Madian reciting to them our verses, but we were senders of this message. We have revealed this message. And you were not at the side of the Mount when we called Musa, but were sent as a mercy from your Lord to warn a people to whom no warner had come before you so that they might be reminded because for a long time, there was no warner who came to the people of Arabia. And if not that a disaster should strike them for what their hands put forth of sins, and they would say, our Lord, why did you not send us a messenger so we could have followed your verses and been among the believers? But when the truth came to them from us, they said, why was it not given like that which was given to Musa? Did they not disbelieve? in that which was given to Musa before. They said, they are but two works of magic supporting each other, referring to the Torah and the Quran. And indeed we are in both disbelievers. So they denied both scriptures. Say, then bring a scripture from Allah, which is more guiding than either of them so that I may follow it. If you should be truthful, and if you're rejecting the Torah and the Quran, then why don't you bring a third scripture which you think is more guiding than them. But if they do not respond to you, then know that they only follow their own desires. And who is more astray than one who follows his desire without guidance from Allah? Yani, the one who is the most astray is the one who follows his desire without knowledge, without guidance. Indeed, Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Now remember, Following desires without knowledge is desire worship. It is taking one's desires as God. And such people are deprived of hidayah. They're deprived of guidance. And we have repeatedly conveyed to them the Quran so that they might be reminded. Those to whom we gave the scripture before it, there are believers in it. And when it is recited to them, they say, we have believed in it. Indeed, it is the truth from our Lord. Indeed, we were, even before it, Muslims. Muslims submitting to Allah. Those will be given the reward twice. Why? For what they patiently endured. And because they avert evil through good. And from what we have provided them, they spend. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that from the people of the book, the one who believes in his own messenger, and then he believes in the Prophet وسلم, he will have double reward, one for believing in his own scripture, in his own messenger, and one for believing in the last and final prophet and believing in the Quran. And then Allah describes their qualities here. What are their qualities? Number one, patience, sabr. Number two, they avert evil with good. And number three, they spend from what Allah has provided them. Many times we are patient, we adopt sabr, and we also spend from our wealth, but 
we don't find ourselves being able to respond to evil with good. We find that very difficult, very hard. Like for example, you attend a gathering, okay? You go to a gathering, a party, a dinner, and someone does not even acknowledge you, pretends that you don't even exist. They don't even smile at you. They don't come to say the salam to you, but you get up and you say the salam to that person. And then when you find out that they need some help, they need some financial help, you fulfill their needs, you help them out. You do ihsan to their children, you do ihsan to their family. Now this is indeed a quality of the highest degree, of the highest level. Otherwise, usually, what is our way? What is our behavior? If someone doesn't ask about us, we don't ask about them. If someone doesn't do good to us, we don't do good to them either. Similarly, you help someone, okay? You help someone, but they didn't send you a thank you message. So you think, she didn't say thank you to me. Next time, I'm not going to help her. I'll just help someone else. Or you see, in Ramadan, you, you send food to your neighbors or you, fend, you send food to your relatives. So you send food to them, but there's no thank you. There's no appreciation. You don't hear anything from them. And you're like, you know what? Next time I'm not sending anything. Okay. Then let's understand this with another example. So the next level, because there are levels in this. Then you help someone. Okay. So they were sick. You stayed in the hospital with them. Okay. So you were there with them, looking after them, taking care of them, giving them company. But when they're better, when they're healthy, they start speaking evil about you. Like, you know, sometimes you do everything for your parents, everything. You're taking care of them, looking after them. But then in their frustration, in their anger, in their sickness, they begin to scold you, they curse you. So that at the moment you think, I did so much for them. This is what they do in response. You know what? Khalas, that's it. Someone else should look after them. My sister should look after them or my brother should look after them. No, no, remember, who is a muhsin? A muhsin is the one who responds to evil with good, whether it is with his gestures or his tongue or his hands, that you tolerate the hurt that comes to you from others and then you normalize the situation. You don't make a big deal out of it. And then another way of understanding averting evil with good is that if you make a mistake, if you do something wrong, then follow it up with a good action. And that good action will wipe out the bad action. And this is from the highest standard of character. And then some more qualities. And when they hear ill speech, they turn away from it and say, for us are our deeds and for you are your deeds. Peace will be upon you. We seek not the ignorant. So they don't mess with the ignorant. And this is also a great quality. Indeed, O oh Prophet, you do not guide whom you like. Innaka la tahdi man ahbabs. Allahu Akbar. You don't guide whom you like. You don't guide whom you love. A person loves his children the most. He loves his parents the most. But sometimes even though you make sincere efforts to guide them, they're not guided. And that is because guidance is in the hands of Allah. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ But Allah guides whom he wills. وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ And he's most knowing of the rightly guided. And they say, if we were to follow the guidance with you, we would be swept from our land. We don't show our Muslim identity because we will not get those privileges that we get by hiding our identity. These people had the same fear that if we follow the guidance that is with you, we would be swept away from our land. Have we not established for them a safe sanctuary to which are brought the fruits of all things as provision from us? But most of them do not know. You know, what fear do you have? Allah has given you all blessings. What more do you want? And how many cities have we destroyed that was insolent in its way of living? They were very proud of their lifestyle. They were proud of their economy. And those are their dwellings, which have not been inhabited after them, except briefly, just by travelers who are just passing by for a day or two. And it is we who were the inheritors. They left and they had no heirs. 
and they, all of them were wiped out. And now their dwellings lie desolate, empty. And never would your Lord have destroyed the cities until he had sent to their mother a messenger. Mother meaning the mother city, the main city, a messenger reciting to them our verses. Now this tells us that messengers have always come to the main city because the message spreads from there. The message quickly spreads from there and also because the population is more compared to the villages. And we would not destroy the cities except while their people were wrongdoers. And whatever thing you people have been given, it is only for the enjoyment of worldly life and its adornment. You know, all that you have is only for here. So isn't it better that you use it for the hereafter? And what is with Allah is better and more lasting. So will you not use reason? Then is he whom we have promised a good promise, which he will obtain, like he for whom we provided enjoyment of worldly life, but then he is on the day of resurrection among those presented for the punishment, those presented for hellfire, and warn of the day he will call them and say, where are my partners which you used to claim? Where are they today? Those upon whom the word will have come into effect will say, our Lord, these are the ones we led to error. We led them to error just as we were in error. We declare our disassociation from them to you. They did not use to worship us. And it will be said, invoke your partners. And they will invoke them, but they will not respond to them. And they will see the punishment if only they had followed guidance. If only they had followed guidance. And mention the day he will call them and say, what did you answer the messengers? But the information will be unapparent to them that day, so they will not be able to ask one another. But as for one who had repented, believed, and done righteousness, it is promised by Allah that he will be among the successful. And your Lord creates what he wills and chooses. And this is why we should make dua to Allah that, O oh Allah, take work from me and not replace me. Don't replace me, but take this work from me. Not for them was the choice. Exalted is Allah and high above what they associate with him. So remember, all goodness is in the hands of Allah. So while doing any work, ask for goodness. Ask for khair. And what is that dua that you make when you ask for goodness? That specific dua when you're seeking khair, when you're seeking goodness. It's called istikhara. Istikhara. The Prophet Sallallahu would teach istikhara, the dua of istikhara, just as he would teach the Qur'an. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says about istikhara, that the one who seeks goodness from Allah and consults the creation and adopts firmness in his work, then he will not be disappointed. This is like when the Prophet Sallallahu sent the marriage proposal to Zainab radiallahu anha, she said in response, I will not respond until I seek Allah's assistance. I will not respond until I do istikhara. And subhanAllah, she started praying istikhara here and there Allah revealed the verses of the Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab. Okay, but the point is that even if it is a good deed that you want to do, do istikhara. Like for example, you want to go for hajj, make istikhara so that Allah creates ease for you in the journey. And your Lord knows what their breasts conceal and what they declare. And he is Allah. There's no deity except him. To him is due all praise in the first life and the hereafter. In this world and the hereafter, Hamd belongs to Allah. And his is the final decision. And to him you will be returned. O Prophet say, have you considered if Allah should make for you the night continuous until the day of resurrection? that there's only night and no day, what deity other than Allah could bring you light? Then will you not hear? Say, have you considered, if Allah should make for you the day continuous until the day of resurrection, and there's no night, what deity other than Allah could bring you a night in which you may rest? 
then will ye not see? And out of his mercy, he made for you the night and the day that you may rest therein. If Allah wanted, it could have been night continuous. If he wanted, it could have been day continuous, but he didn't do that. Out of his mercy, he has made both for you, the night and the day that come in alternation. It's not that night remains for 10 days and then day remains for 10 days, no. It's a cycle. The night comes, the day departs. And then when the night departs, the day comes. And out of his mercy, he made for you the night and the day that you may rest therein, that you may rest during the night. And by day seek from his bounty and that perhaps you will be grateful. So this ayah tells us what it means to be on the fitrah. To be on the fitrah means that you work during the day and you sleep during the night. Obviously necessity, exceptional situations are something different, but this is the norm. And one of the day he will call them and say, where are my partners, the so-called partners, which you used to claim? And we will extract from every nation a witness and say, produce your proof. Where is your evidence? And they will know that the truth belongs to Allah and lost from them is that which they used to invent. Then after this, Qarun is mentioned. Inna Qarun kana min qawmi Musa tadagha alayhim. Indeed, Qarun was from the people of Musa, but he tyrannized them. Now, Qarun was from the Bani Israel, but he joined forces with Fir'aun and his people. And such people exist in every era, where they leave their own people and they join forces with others. And we gave him of treasures whose keys would burden a band of strong men. So from this, you can realize how much, how much wealth he had, that just the keys to his treasures would be held by a group of strong men. And that too, the keys would burden them. Thereupon, and this is just what is said about the keys, then imagine what would be his wealth like. Thereupon his people said to him, do not exalt, do not be arrogant. Indeed, Allah does not like the exultant. And they also said to him, But seek, but seek through that which Allah has given you, the home of the hereafter. And yet, do not forget your share of the world. And it shouldn't be that you get so lost in the goods of this world that you forget about everything else. No, the wealth that Allah has given to you, use it for your needs and also earn through it the home of the hereafter. And do good. وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ As Allah has done good to you. And desire not corruption in the land. Indeed, Allah does not like the corruptors. So we learn from this that the cause of corruption many times is abundance of wealth, abundance of money. So a person doesn't know how to handle that money and it leads to facade. Now you see the purpose of our life in this world is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're being tested. In everything we're tested. This is the test. It's a test to see who does the best deeds, who does ahsan amal. And here as well, wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Do good as Allah has done good to you. And they give to others. Bring delight to others as Allah has brought you delight. Whatever good that Allah has bestowed you with, bring it to others also. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah gives special blessings to some of his servants in order to benefit his creation through them. If he spends, then his blessings remain safe. And if he withholds, then Allah takes it away from him and gives it to others. So blessings remain when we keep sharing them with others. And when a person stops sharing them, then blessings are also taken away. Baqarun didn't take a lesson. He didn't change his behavior. And he said, indi. I was only given it because of knowledge I have. And even today, many people consider their accomplishments, their achievements, their wealth, or their good jobs, their own effort. Whereas you see, there are many people who have the same qualifications, 
or even better qualifications who are without jobs, either because no one is hiring or because there's not much demand for that job anymore. And then the person has to change their line of work. And this is why whatever good job that you have, consider it. The fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hada min fadli rabbi. This is from the bounty of my Lord. It's from his mercy. Similarly, a person shouldn't boast over his knowledge. He shouldn't be proud over the knowledge that Allah has given to him. The Prophet sallallahu said, whoever seeks knowledge in order to compete with the scholars or to argue with the foolish or to turn people's faces towards him, let him take his seat in the fire. So Qarun, he was proud of himself, of his own efforts. I was only given it, you know, all this wealth that I have is because of the knowledge that I have. Did he not know that Allah had destroyed before him of generations, those who were greater than him in power and greater in accumulation of wealth? SubhanAllah. There were people before him who had more wealth than him. We think Qarun had a lot of wealth, but guess what? There were people before him who had more than him, but Allah destroyed them. Their wealth didn't benefit them. Their wealth, their power, their authority didn't avail them against Allah's punishment. But the criminals about their sins will not be asked because it's clear that what they have done is wrong. So he came up before his people in his adornment. So he came up with his bling bling, his adornment, the zina, his entourage, his wealth. Those who desired the worldly life said, so some people, when they saw him and the zina, the adornment, they said, oh, would that we had like what was given to Qarun. So they're wishing for whatever Qarun has. Indeed, he's one of great fortune. He's so lucky. He is so fortunate. He has so much wealth and this and that. And this is really human weakness that when we see a nice car or when we see a huge mansion or when we see uh, many children or qualified children, we begin to wish. I wish I also had this. I wish I also had that. But remember, those who have knowledge, they know the reality of all these things. And they know that the things of this world are not worth drooling over because you don't know how the other person has acquired it. And if you see a huge mansion and you're wishing that you had that, you don't know the whole story behind it. You don't know what's going on in the life of that person, what's happening behind the scenes. You're just looking at the apparent and wishing to be like that one. So when a person has knowledge, he understands the reality. Which is why, but those who had been given knowledge said, woe to you, woe to you. The reward of Allah is better for he who believes and does righteousness. It is better than loads and loads of wealth in the life of this world. And none are granted it except the patient. Knowledge requires from a person that he prefers the hereafter over the life of this world, and that he adopts sabr, he adopts patience with his situation in life, that he controls his desires, that he doesn't let his desires wander here and there. And even otherwise, if you think about it, when you embark on the journey of seeking knowledge, sometimes you may have to make sacrifices and compromises to some of the benefits of the life of this world. You know, a person we have a very, very busy schedule, but out of that busy schedule for the dunya, they may have to take out time to study the deen, to do the work of the deen. And this requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of sabr. Now, if you read about the lives of the righteous predecessors, how much they sacrificed in the way of knowledge. Imam al-Bukhari traveled so much to learn and then it is said that they would spend their entire days in learning. When one class would finish, they would move on to the next class and then to the next class. So much so that they wouldn't have the time to eat sometimes or even cook a meal for themselves. And so they would eat raw food. They busied themselves in gaining knowledge. So even though they made some compromises to 
some of the benefits of this world, but it is with this patience that they gain the knowledge of the deen themselves, benefiting themselves, and also benefiting all those who came later on. If they didn't make these sacrifices, how would this pure, authentic knowledge reach us? Do you know, after the Book of Allah, after the Book of Allah, after the Quran, you know, the Quran is the most authentic book because it is Allah's kalam, it is Allah's word, his speech. But when it comes to the book, books of the creation, which one is the most authentic? Hmm? Do you know? Sahih al-Bukhari. And really, if you're able to study about his life, do study about his life, and you will be amazed at the sacrifices that he made to compile the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was, it's, it's these sacrifices of these scholars that we're benefiting from today. And this requires patience. وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ so what happened to Qarun? What was his fate? What was his end? And we caused the earth to swallow him. Now the swallowing of the earth, the earth swallowing is a punishment that is mentioned for arrogance. So because of his arrogance, and he exalted himself or he tried to exalt himself, but he was brought low. He was reduced, he was lowered. And we caused the earth to swallow him and his home. And there was for him no company to aid him other than Allah, nor was he of those who could defend themselves. And those who had wished for his position the previous day began to say, oh, how Allah extends provision to whom he wills of his servants and restricts it. If not that Allah had conferred favor on us, he would have caused it to swallow us. And we would have had the same end as him. Oh, how the disbelievers don't succeed. Because al-mar'u ma'aman ahabba. Man is with the one whom he loves. And so if he loves the people of wealth, then he will be among them. But because these people understood the deen, they took a lesson and they were grateful that their outcome was not with Qarun because earlier they were wishing for what he had. So here they're expressing gratitude that they are saved from that outcome. Allah then says, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ that home of the hereafter, we assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon the earth, or corruption. Any those who are not arrogant, those who don't want to control others, those who don't do fasad, the home of the hereafter is for them. Because you see, when a person desires uluf, when he wishes to have all the control in his hands, that not a leaf can move in the house except with that person's permission. This is desiring uluf. And this desire for uluf, this desire for exaltedness, for greatness, that I am so great, I should be respected, I should be given importance. You know, some people are like this. They get so upset if you don't ask about them. If you don't show importance to them, they will get very, very upset. And sometimes you see this happening in houses and homes where it could be anyone. Like for example, a woman, the woman of the house is so controlling that the husband, the children, the, the daughter-in-law, they're all helpless, they're all scared because of the control that one person wants to have. So we need to come out of this. We need to come out of this and give breathing space to people. Live and let live. Give them freedom, you'll be happier, and they'll be happier, okay? Now, this is at a small level, but also at a bigger level, whether it comes to organizations, institutes, or at a national level. Yani, a person should not desire uluf, that I am everything. I need to have the control over everyone. So Jannah, the home of the hereafter, is for whom? Those who don't desire exaltedness upon the earth. And those who don't spread corruption. And the best outcome is for the righteous. Now, you will notice that the surah began with the mention of Fir'aun and it concludes with the mention of Qarun. At the beginning, the uluf of Fir'aun was mentioned. He also desired exaltedness on the earth by controlling the people and dividing them. And here, the uluf 
of Qarun has been mentioned. Yani, the lesson that we learn here is that in order to get Jannah, we need to free ourselves from such traits. We need to humble ourselves and instill taqwa in our hearts. Allah then says, Man jaa bil hasana, whoever comes with a good deed, meaning on the day of judgment, whoever comes with a good deed will have better than it. And whoever comes with an evil deed, then those who did evil deeds will not be recompensed except as much as what they used to do. Indeed, O Prophet, he who imposed upon you the Quran will take you back to a place of return. He will fulfill his promise the way he fulfilled his promises with Musa alayhi salam. And the purpose, you see, the purpose of mentioning these stories is to reassure the Prophet sallallahu Say, my Lord is most knowing of who brings guidance and who is in clear error. And you are not expecting that the book would be conveyed to you, but it is a mercy from your Lord. So do not be an assistant to the disbelievers and never let them avert you from the verses of Allah after they have been revealed to you. And invite people to your Lord and never be of those who associate others with Allah. وَلَا تَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. And do not invoke with Allah another deity. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هو. There is no deity worthy of worship except Him. كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَهُ Everything will be destroyed except His face. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ Everything on this earth will perish. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ except for the face of your Lord. There will remain the face of your Lord. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram. Lahul Hukum. His is the judgment. Wa ilayhi turja'un and to him you will be returned. Surah Al Ankabut. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the ever merciful. Alif Lamim. Ahasib al Nasu and Yutraku and Yaqulu Amanna wahum la yuftanun. Do the people think that they'll be left to say we believe and they will not be tried? Remember, whoever brings Iman will be tested. And every person is tested according to his deen. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said, I asked, O Messenger of Allah, who is tested most severely? He said, the prophets, then the righteous, then the next best. A man is tested according to the level of his faith. If his deen is firm, his test is increased. And if his faith is weak, then his test is lightened. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, the believing man and the woman is continued to be tried with distress, sorry, concerning his health, wealth, or children until when he meets Allah, no sin of his remains. And if these tests becomes a means of purification, a means of expiation. And we have certainly tried those before them and Allah will surely make evident those who are truthful and he will surely make evident the liars. Allah already knows from before, but he intends to make this knowledge evident before people. And that's the purpose or one of the purposes of the test. Or do those who do evil deeds think that they can outrun us? Evil is what they judge. Man kana yarju liqa Allah. Whoever should hope for the meeting with Allah. Fa in ajal Allah laat. Indeed, the term decreed by Allah is coming. Wa huwa samiu alim, and He is the hearing, the knowing. So a person should make hard effort in hope of meeting Allah. He should prepare for that meeting. So a person should not think that right now I have a lot of time left. We'll see when we go for Hajj. We'll see when we become old. No, whatever age you are, prepare for the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever strives only strives for the benefit of himself. Indeed, Allah is free from need of the world. So the one who strives, the benefit of that striving comes back to him. And those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will surely remove from them their misdeeds and we will surely reward them according to the best of what they used to do. 
and we have enjoined upon man goodness to parents. But if they endeavor to make you associate with me, that of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them. So a person cannot listen to everything that his parents say to him. If they tell him to commit shirk, if they tell him to disobey Allah, then he will not listen to them. To me is your return, and I will inform you about what you used to do. Remember, the haq of Allah is more than the haq of parents. And, and then the greatest right after the right of Allah is the right of parents. So much so that a person should maintain ties with his mushrik parents. Even if they're mushrik, even if they're disobedient, even if they're not believers, he must maintain ties with them and not cut off from them. Abdullah ibn Ubayn, who was the leader of the hypocrites, he was the head of the hypocrites. However, his son Abdullah was a true sincere believer. And once the Prophet Sallallahu was riding on a donkey, and as he passed by Abdullah ibn Ubay, some dust fell on his clothes. Okay, it fell on him from the tracks of the animal. So Abdullah ibn Ubay got upset, he got angry, and in spite, he said, Ibn Abi Qabsha threw dust on us. Now, when his son heard this, when the son of Abdullah ibn Ubay heard this, he was very angry. And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu by the one who has honored you and revealed the book to you, I can cut off his head because of what he has said. The Prophet Sallallahu said, no, rather do good to your father and treat him with kindness. Even though his father was who? Abdullah bin Ubay, he was the leader of the hypocrites. But the Prophet Sallallahu says to the son, do good to your father and treat him with kindness. These are the teachings of our religion. You know, sometimes when children begin to learn the deen, they become overzealous and they become very strict and very stern. And you will find, you will find them saying things like, my parents are taking interest, my parents are doing this. So we're going to leave the house. We're never going to speak to them again. Remember, whatever they do is their action. Yes, advise them, but you cannot boycott your parents. And if they need your help, you must help them. You must maintain ties with them no matter what they're doing. Their matter lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will be asked about your deeds. You will be asked about your actions. Okay. And even in the case where if they're telling you to do something wrong, you will not listen to them. But this does not mean that you become disrespectful. Okay. You will not listen to them when they're telling you to disobey Allah, but at the same time, you will maintain the respect, you will maintain good treatment. And in this, you see the best example is the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So anyhow, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ So basically what is mentioned in this ayah is number one, a person should do good to his parents. And number two, if they endeavor, if they strive to make you associate partners with Allah, then do not obey them. Okay, and one must remember that our return is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have to answer to him. And he will inform us of what we have done. And those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will surely admit them among the righteous into paradise. And of the people are some who say, we believe in Allah. But when one of them is harmed for the cause of Allah, they consider the trial of the people as if it were the punishment of Allah. Even a little hardship in the path of the deen, he considers it a huge mountain. But if victory comes from your Lord, they say, indeed, we were with you. Is not Allah most knowing of what is within the breast of all creatures? And Allah will surely make evident those who believe, and he will surely make evident the hypocrites. And those who disbelieve say to those who believe, follow our way and we will carry your sins. But they will not carry anything of their sins. Indeed, they are liars. But they will carry their own burdens and other burdens along with their burdens. And they will surely be questioned on the day of resurrection about what they used to do, about what they used to invent. And they will surely be questioned on the day of resurrection about what they used to invent. Now see, the human being, what we learn here is that he will not only carry his own sins, but also the burdens of those whom he misled. 
meaning whoever initiates an evil deed or a bad trend and then whoever follows him he will carry a share of the sin of all those who followed him and we certainly send Nuh to his people and he remained among them a thousand years minus 50 years a millennium almost and the flood seized them while they were wrongdoers but we saved him and the companions of the ship and we made it a sign for the worlds and we sent Ibrahim when he said to his people worship Allah and fear him that is best for you if you should know you only worship besides Allah idols and you produce a falsehood indeed those you worship besides Allah do not possess for you the power of provision they can't provide for you so seek from Allah provision and worship him and be grateful to him to him you will be returned and if you people deny the message already nations before you have denied and there's not upon the messenger except the duty of clear notification have they not considered how Allah begins creation and then repeats it indeed that for Allah is easy O Prophet say, travel through the land and observe how he began the creation. Then Allah will produce the final creation. Indeed, Allah over all things is competent. So being raised again after death, we need to be certain of this. The one who created the first time can create again as well. He punishes whom he wills and has mercy upon whom he wills and to him you will be returned. And you will not cause failure to Allah upon the earth or in the heaven. And you have not other than Allah any protector or any helper. And the ones who disbelieve in the signs of Allah and the meeting with him, those have despaired of my mercy and they will have a painful punishment. And the answer of Ibrahim's people was not but that they said, kill him or burn him. But Allah saved him from the fire. Indeed, in that are signs for people who believe. And Ibrahim said, you have only taken other than Allah, idols as a bond of affection among you in worldly life. Then on the day of resurrection, you will deny one another and curse one another and your refuge will be the fire and you will not have any helpers. See in the life of this world, what are mutual friendships based on? They're usually based on something that is common between people, a business, some job, hobby, some sport. Some people play cards together. Some people go to the church together. Some people attend a sport together. Some people go to the masjid together. Any people associate with those whom they like. And you see a believer's basis of love is the love for Allah. His love is not based on personal motives. It's not based on something of the dunya or other worldly benefits of the dunya. And this is a sincere, a very sincere, genuine kind of love. Because if I love someone for their wealth, then what kind of love is that? Tomorrow when that person doesn't have wealth, the love is also gone. And isn't this what is happening in the world that we live in? If you are popular, if you can throw big, huge, fancy parties, then people will love you. But remember, they're not loving you. They are loving the glamour and glitter that comes with you. And when that glamour and glitter is gone, then the love is also gone. So you see, a believer's love for another believer is not because his house is beautiful. It is not because he has a good job. It's not because he has a lot of wealth. It's because of the deen. It's because of the religion. It's because of iman. And this is such... A relationship that will remain till the very end whether the other person becomes a millionaire or he loses all his wealth yesterday you were my friend today too you are my friend because the basis of this friendship was the religion and it is this friendship that will last till the day of judgment this is what is going to matter but unfortunately we still don't understand this and we prefer the life of this world in our relationships. Like for example, a very small example when it comes to proposals. In the matter of proposals, what do we give priority to? Usually it's worldly status, how much he earns, how good is his job. Now yes, to a certain extent this should be seen, but to make this a deal breaker shows where our priorities lie. Sometimes you see a person is righteous, 
he has a decent job, but many people don't want to give their daughters in marriage because he's not earning a six-figure sum. Remember, provision is in the hands of Allah. He is the provider. Because if we give importance only to the dunya, then remember, all such relationships will end on the day of judgment. They will cut off from each other. They will become enemies to one another, except for the muttaqeen. Only those who are bound together with taqwa, with iman, will remain friends, even on the day of judgment. And Lut believed in him. Lut salam believed in Ibrahim salam. Ibrahim salam said, indeed, I will emigrate to the service of my Lord. Indeed, he is the exalted in might, the wise. And we gave to him Ishaq and Yaqub and placed in his descendants prophethood and scripture. And we gave him his reward in this world. And indeed, he is in the hereafter among the righteous. And mentioned Lut, when he said to his people, indeed, you commit such immorality as no one has preceded you with from among the worlds. So this shows that this evil started with this nation. No one before them ever did this. And what was their evil? Indeed, you approach men and obstruct the road and commit in your meetings every evil. Yani, they would openly do evil in their clubs. Nadikum, nadi refers to a club. They would commit evil in front of everyone. And the answer of his people was not but that they said, bring us the punishment of Allah if you should be of the truthful. So they're challenging the messenger here. Qala, he said, Rabbin surni al mufsidin. My Lord, support me against the corrupting people. Because he had no other supporter, so he's asking Allah for support. And when our messengers came to Ibrahim with the good news, with the glad tidings, they said, indeed, we will destroy the people of that city, yani Lut salam city. Indeed, its people have been wrongdoers. Ibrahim salam said, indeed, within it is Lut, inna fiha Luta. what about him? They said, we're more knowing of who is within it. The angels already knew. We will surely save him and his family, except his wife, because she sympathized with her people. She is to be of those who remain behind. And when our messengers came to Lut, he was distressed for them and felt for them great discomfort because he did not know that they were angels. Prophets don't have knowledge of the unseen. They said to him, fear not, nor grieve. Indeed, we will save you and your family, except your wife. She is to be of those who remain behind. Indeed, we will bring down on the people of this city punishment from the sky because they have been defiantly disobedient. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, apart from this indecency, other sins were also found among the people of Lut. One of them was that they would deprive each other of their rights. And then they would also openly curse one another with vulgar words. Men would dress like women and women would dress like men. They would tax the merchants and also committed shirk. And same gender relations began with them. And that is why they're described as people who are defiantly disobedient. بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ Fisk. Fisk means to cross the limit. وَلَقَدْ تَرَكْنَا مِنْهَا آيَةً وَلَقَدْ تَرَكْنَا مِنْهَا آيَةً بَيِّنَهَا And we have certainly left of it a sign as clear evidence لِقَوْمِ يَاقِلُونَ for a people who use reason. And to Madian, we sent their brother Shu'aib. And he said, O oh my people, worship Allah and expect the last day. And do not commit abuse on the earth spreading corruption. But they denied him. So the earthquake seized them and they became within their home corpses fallen prone. And we destroyed Ad and Samud. And it has become clear to you from their ruined dwellings. And when you look at their dwellings, the dwellings are standing, but there's nobody there. And by looking at the desolate dwellings, it has become clear to you that, they, that these people were destroyed. And Shaytan had made pleasing to them their deeds and averted them from the path, and they were endowed with perception. Just think about it. Those who made huge houses and carved the mountains, they were not people with ordinary skill. They were intelligent and smart people 
when it came to worldly matters, but shaitan adorned their deeds. So they thought that their intelligence was everything. And as a result, they denied their messenger. And we destroyed Qarun and Fir'aun and Haman. And Musa had already come to them with clear evidences and they were arrogant in the land, but they were not outrunners. They were not outrunners of our punishment. They could not escape the punishment of Allah. So each we seized for his sin and among them were those upon whom we sent a storm of stones. And, uh, and among them were those who were seized by the blast from the sky. And among them were those whom we caused the earth to swallow. And among them were those whom we drowned. And Allah would not have wronged them, but it was they who were wronging themselves. The example of those who take allies other than Allah. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَا كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ اتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتًا وَإِنَّ أَوْهَنَ الْبُيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ The example of those who take allies other than Allah is like that of the spider who takes a home. And indeed, the weakest of homes is the home of the spider, if they only knew. The spider is one of the weakest of creatures. And its house is among the weakest of houses. And it only becomes weaker by building it because it neither protects it from heat nor from cold, nor does it provide it with any shelter. This is how those people, this is how those people are who take others besides Allah's allies. They are weak and incapable in all ways. And when they take these allies besides Allah, for the purpose of seeking honor from them, for the purpose of benefiting from them, then this only adds to their weakness because they put their trust in them to achieve what they seek to achieve, but these false gods cannot do anything for them. So they don't achieve any result through them. Yani, all supports besides Allah are like a spider's web. Can you get any help from a spider's web? Can you hold it? Can you grab it when falling? Can you take it as a support? Even if you try to, you will fall flat to the ground or the web would get stuck to you and then freeing yourself would be another problem in itself. As a matter of fact, the, fight, the spider would harm you in return. And if, if you get caught in the spider's web, it's not going to protect you or support you or help you in any way. It's the opposite. So that is the example that is mentioned here. Indeed, Allah knows whatever thing they call upon other than him, and he is the exalted and might, the wise. And these examples we present to the people, but none will understand them except those of knowledge. Those who have knowledge are the ones who understand the examples that Allah presents in the Quran. And what is the lesson to be learned from this example? That Allah is the greatest support and all others besides him are weak, helpless, powerless. They cannot even help themselves. How can they help you? Just the way a spider's web is the weakest of homes. It cannot provide shelter. It cannot protect from heat nor from cold. Similarly, those whom people take as false gods seeking their support cannot support them, cannot benefit them, cannot do anything for them. So the betterment of a person is to turn to Allah and hold on to him, to hold fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the greatest support. He is the all-powerful, the almighty. And then at the end, خَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ Allah created the heavens and the earth in truth. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed in that is a sign for the believers. There's a sign for the believers in the creation of the heavens and the earth. So it is the believers who take a lesson. It's because their iman enables them to reflect and ponder and reach the conclusion. And
وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم إن نسألك الثبات في الأمر والعزيمة على الرشد ونسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك ونسألك شكر نعمتك وحسن عبادتك وحسن عبادتك ونسألك قلبا سليما ولسانا صادقا ونسألك من خير ما تعلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما تعلم ونستغفرك لما تعلم إنك أنت علام الغيوب اللهم إن نعوذ بك من جهد البلاء ودرك الشقاء وسوء القضاء وشماتة الأعداء ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته